End of the week. So we're going to finish, hopefully finish up our synchronization primitives uh, and synchronization problems week this week, which will allow us to move on to uh, thread scheduling and maybe even get into some memory management next week. So oh, it's a little bit of a thin crowd this morning. This is about that time in the semester, I guess. Friday at 9 starts to become a little bit of a heavier lift. Um, OK, so, so today we're going to talk a little bit about one of the problems you can run into using locks, which is deadlock. Um, and then we're going to walk through two other synchronization primitives. And I've changed the flow a little bit this year so that we'll, we'll look at each primitive and then we'll do an example. So we're going to look at condition variables, which are quite useful, something that you guys will want to use for assignment two and probably for assignment three as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about semaphores, which are probably the, the least useful primitive of the ones that, that you guys are, um, well, I guess you're not asked to implement, but of the ones that are implemented or will be implemented on your system. But there are some cases where semaphores are useful. And then we'll talk just a couple slides about, you know, more general advice about how to choose the right primitive for you, or probably more accurately for the problem you're trying to solve. Um, all right, so assignment one grading should work. Again, if you guys submit uh, patches that you think should apply and they don't, or things that you think should work and don't, please let us know uh, and we'll, we'll look at it. I think what's up there works, uh, but you know, who knows? There's always a possibility that, uh, that there's something broken. So, um, and if I was you and I was taking this class and uh, nobody had forced me to complete things by any particular point in time, but I was still hoping to be able to complete things by the one point in time where you do have to complete things, I would probably be working on assignment one at this point and hoping to wrap that up next week so I can get on to assignment two, right? So if how many people are working on assignment one? How many people have submitted a patch for assignment one? I have. <laughs> Mine worked. <laughs> um, OK, so, so yeah, let's, let's get to that point that, that that part is open, so you guys should be able to. And, and look, like you can, again, you can submit that as many times as you want. I'm not encouraging you guys to, to bang against it, to do incremental, uh, sort of incremental grading. But if you guys have a lock implementation you think works, you know, run the lock test. I mean, our testing doesn't do anything that you can't do yourself. In fact, it does the exact, exactly the same things that you would do yourself. So if you run the lock test a few times, and you pass, and you run our, our CV tests, and you pass those, and you know you run a couple of the problems, and, and the output looks correct to you. Then, you know, then you should be in good shape, right? So it shouldn't be a big surprise when you submit things. We're, again, we're not doing anything that you can't do locally. So do some testing first, but but please get on to starting assignment one. All right. Um, any questions on last time? So last time we looked at uh, two different ways to implement locks. We looked at spin locks, which are busy waiting, which involve busy waiting and force threads to wait actively until some condition changes. And then we also looked at sleep locks, which are, in many cases, a more efficient solution that allow threads to sleep and wait to be awakened. So any questions about that material before we do a very brief review? Any questions? OK. So spinning is almost never a good, good idea on a Kevin. What kind of machine would I never want to spin on, or almost never want to spin on? Not sure. Frank, can you help him out? A yeah, on a single processor system, because frequently the thing I'm waiting for is for some other thread to finish. And if I am holding the CPU, I am preventing that thread from finishing what it's doing. So the longer I sleep, the longer I will have to wait, right? Um, and when I'm deciding which synchronization primitive to use, whether to wait actively or wait passively, um, what, 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 what might I want to consider about the length of the critical section on our argument? Yeah, so if the critical section is short, then I might spin, right? It's, you know, there's still some other cases where I wouldn't want to spin. But if the critical section is short, I might want to spin. And if I know the critical section is long, then I probably definitely want to, to sleep. Right. OK? Why? What's, and, and what's kind of like the, the constant here that creates this, this design decision? What's the thing? What's the overhead I'm worried about, Andrew? Yeah, see, he's smart. He's got <laughs> slides from last year or notes or something open. You know? Answers all my questions. Uh, right, if the critical section is short, then 
the context switch overhead waste cycles because I'm switched off the CPU, something else has to run, the scheduler runs, and you know, very quickly into that process, whatever I was waiting for became available and I could have continued, right? What's the interface to a lock? Wembley, you're way in the back today. It's blowing my mind a little bit. Uh, what, sorry, what's the interface to a lock? What, what are the functions that I use to? What's one of them? Test and set? Well, that's the interface to a test and set. Manish. Yeah, acquire and release. Grab the lock. I lock the resource when I begin using it or at the top of a critical section. And then I unlock the resource when, I'm, when I complete using it. Right? And, and what's one, one very common use of locks, which I just slipped up and set? Robert. To protect a resource so that you can't. What, what specific resource? A critical section, right? A critical section, a, a portion of code that I do not want more than one thread executing. And I use a lock, and I acquire the lock at the top, and I drop it at the bottom, right? All right, any other questions about this before we keep, continue on? Questions about locks? Start playing the Jeopardy theme music during these awkward pauses. Um, OK, so, the free, so frequently what's going to happen, and this is a, a question that kind of dovetails nicely with Brian's question last time about uh, lock granularity, right? So. Locks protect access to these shared resources, but frequently in order to, to perform some useful, uh, useful function on your system, a thread will have to access multiple shared resources. And those shared resources may each have their own lock. And at this point, I can run into problems. Right? So whenever I start using multiple locks, you have to be aware of the classic lock problem. Right? So consider these two threads, A and B, that they both need access to shared resources one and two that are both protected by a lock, right? So thread A runs first. It grabs the lock for resource one. Now I have a context switch, OK? Thread B runs. Do you like that? It's like, whoo. Like there should be like a big graphic, like, boom. Uh, so thread B runs, grabs the lock for resource two. OK, so now what's going to happen? Context switch. What happens next? You guys know how the story ends. Yeah, thread A runs, tries to acquire the lock for resource two. And here I'm still OK, except for what's going to happen next, Sean. Thread A is going to sleep, right? Because thread B has the lock for resource two, right? So thread has to wait for it. And again, I'm OK here, but you can tell like we're right on the edge of the cliff because what's about to happen? Sarah. Yep. Thread A and thread B are both now sleeping. And they may be the only threads on the system, in which case nothing will ever happen again. Right? Um, and, and yeah, in, in some cases, nothing. Right? And in fact, uh, I hope in recitation next week, Aditya will show you how to use. There's a tool called Stat161 that you can hook up to your running kernel. And it's a nice tool for identifying deadlocks. Because in certain cases, if your system is sitting there, not doing anything, and you're trying to figure out, is it not responding? Is it not like painting? Or, or, or is, it doing, is it actually trying to finish something? Or is it just waiting for nothing to happen? Right? And you can use Stat161 to demonstrate the fact that your system is, in fact, sitting there doing nothing, which usually means that all of your threads are sleeping, waiting for something that's never going to happen, because the thing they're waiting for is asleep. Right? So this is this classic condition, which is called deadlock. Right? So deadlock occurs when a thread or a set of threads are waiting for each other to finish, and thus nobody ever does. Right? So deadlock always involves some kind of circularity. Right? Um, and that circularity can be quite tight, right? Quite very small. So how can a single thread deadlock? Sam. Um, I, mean, well, I mean, in that case, it would probably just wait. And assuming that resource is held by somebody else, it would eventually, it would eventually run. Sirach, how could this happen? 
a single thread deadlocks. I mean, this, this is kind of a, I mean, this isn't a trick question. You guys will wonder why this happens, and we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, like what happens if I call lock acquire, and then immediately I call lock acquire again? That is that will deadlock, right? So this is this is called self deadlock. Thread A acquires a resource, and then Thread A acquires, tries to reacquire the resource. But why would this happen? This seems like just a completely trivial, stupid programming bug, right? Why would I ever have a piece of code? that said acquire lock A, and then the next line said acquire lock A. How would this happen? Spencer. Is this, just, is this something that's like super easy to fix? Like, oh, duh. You know, it was like those, you know, those bugs where you get where it's like you had a null pointer exception, and you went and found it, and it was like you know, dereference null. Right? Like, so is, that, is this this easy to fix, do you think, all the time? You're going to say no. It's a good answer. <laughs> So, so what, what could happen here that would cause this, that would make it very difficult to, to, to find? Or, or why does this happen at all? Sean. No, I'm, I'm going to argue that this can happen even if the, if, even if the save and restore state's correct. Right, so you're saying there's a correctness problem in the kernel. I'm going to say even if there isn't a correctness problem in the kernel, this can happen. Yeah. Um, what if the program runs like you acquired a lock on a certain resource, and then after acquiring the lock, you process, uh, you continue running the uh, thread. Right. But the down you have to acquire a resource, and that resource has to be copied. Yeah, you're getting closer. Yeah, assume it. Well, again, I would say that would be a programming error, right? Don't acquire a lock in a loop, right? <laughs> you know, if, unless the loop has, is 4i equals 0, i less than 0, right? Then you're OK. Or less than equal to 0. AJ? Um, you uh, call a function, and that function is always Yeah, so again, this seems inane. But think about what happens here, right? Like you're writing some piece of code. You don't understand, you know, and you're using other functions on the system, right? So you acquire a lock, right? So foo, foo locks resource one, right? And then it calls bar. But foo doesn't know what bar does. Your partner wrote bar, right? Your partner said, hey, I wrote this great function bar. I don't know what it does. <laughs> Goes to the bar, maybe. Um, but anyway, so <laughs> that's a good function. Um, maybe that's what your partner is doing too much of. Um, so, so yeah, so and he said, you know, you can use this when you need to do this thing, right? And he said, great, okay, so I'm writing foo and I need to do the thing that bar does, and I call bar. But it turns out that bar, what does bar do? Bar tries to acquire the lock for resource one, right? Whoops, right? So, and, and this is really complicated. I mean, if you look at real operating system kernels, they're like, I don't, I don't know, I should know the answer to this question. Probably hundreds of thousands of lines of code, right? That are being simultaneously developed by potentially hundreds, if not thousands, mm -hmm. of people, right? So you're not always going to know, and you're not supposed to know what certain functions do or how they do it, right? You're just supposed to be able to call them and rely on the interface guarantees to you know, make your life easier as a programmer, right? Now, there is a solution to this. Not everybody loves this solution, right, or, or endorses it. Um, so there is this idea of a recursive lock. And there are, these are a primitive that are offered by most modern kernels. And, the, and essentially what recursive locks do is they just keep a recursion count on the lock. So the lock can be acquired multiple times, right? To release the lock, what do you have to do then? Let's say I have a lock where I can call lock acquire, lock acquire, lock acquire, and I just keep going if I can tell that the thread has already locked the resource. What do I have to do with the, with the release calls? Tom? Yeah, I have to pair the releases with acquires, right? So if I had a recursive lock that as soon as I called release, it just released the whole lock, then I'd be, I'd be very sad because I'd be popping up the, the call stack and the thread at the top would think that it held the lock, but the thread at the bottom released it, right? So, so, right, so when I write recursive locks in order to get them correct, I need to pair calls to acquire and release. But you can do this, right? Um, and, and, and you may want to re implement recursive locks. I at least found one place in your code base where David Holland has a, has a, a, a mean and uh, an, an un, unpleasant comment about recursive locks. So may, he may, may or may not like them, right? But you may or may not decide that they're a good idea, right? So you can implement these if you would like, right? 
I just, I just want to make one thing clear here. Don't change the semantics of the locks that we gave you. Right? Those are not recursive locks. If you want to work, write, write recursive locks, write them as a separate set of primitives. OK, so in order for there to be a deadlock on the system, there are a series of conditions that have to be met. And the reason why we discuss this is because preventing deadlock means making sure that one of these conditions is not true. So all of these conditions have to be true. And if you want to prevent deadlock, you need to relax or remove one of these conditions. Right? So first of all, you have to have protective access to shared resources. This is pretty, pretty basic. right? That implies waiting. Right? So if threads don't go to sleep ever, then you, know, you can't have deadlock. OK, that's kind of obvious. Um, no resource preemption, which means that the system doesn't have a mechanism for taking resources away from threads that already hold them. So once a thread has a resource, the kernel or the system that's providing the lock primitive doesn't have a good way to like, rip it out of its hands and give it to somebody else. Right? Multiple independent requests which means that I can acquire some subset of the available resources on the system. So when we looked at things before, the thread A and thread B were both requesting resource 1 and resource 2 independently. Okay? If I had to request them together, then I wouldn't have had the problem that I ran into. Okay? And finally, and this is, this is one of the things that's frequently used, so, the, the, so these top three are, are, I would say, the least common ways to remove deadlock conditions. Right? The, dependency circ the cir blah, blah, circular dependency graph is the most common way of avoiding deadlock. Right? This is the most common way of getting yourself out of a deadlock situation. Because most of the time, you want these top three things. You have shared resources. You want protected access. You don't want to have to lock them all together, because then you end up having just one big, giant, ugly lock that is slowing your whole system down. And uh, resource preemption becomes very, very hard to do right. right? Like Once a thread has a lock, like what do I do to get it away? You know, and how do I let it know that? Uh, I took the lock away from you, sorry. You know? um, so, that, so these things are usually kind of difficult to do. But the circular dependency graph is, is one of the things that, that you can usually do. right? But a circular dependency graph means that when I look at the resources that are trying to be acquired and the threads that are trying to acquire them, there's a, cir there's a circularity that's, that, that I can identify. Right? In the self-deadlock case, again, that circularity is on the same thread. Right? Normally, on your system, you'll see deadlocks occurring between multiple threads. Right? So, and it'll be what, like what we showed you before, where thread 1 had resource A, wanted resource B. Thread 2 had resource B, wanted resource A. Right? So I have a, a circle there with two nodes. Okay? So here's the, the classic dining philosopher synchronization problem that is, uh, which I feel obligated to discuss. I don't know why. It's not such a bad problem. Uh, if anybody can identify any of these philosophers, extra credit. I'm not even sure I know who they are. Well, I think I know who two of them are. Well, maybe three. Maybe only two, actually. <laughs> um, OK, so, so you know, I have a, a series of philosophers that have sat down at dinner together. And uh, each uh, to their left and right is a single chopstick. Right? Uh, apparently, this table was not set by the, uh, the crew from Downton Abbey, uh, and because there isn't enough silverware here. right? But, um, anyway, so and, and as they start to eat, uh, what they, happens is that they each first pick up the chopstick or the dining utensil to their, uh, to their left, right? Um, and, but once they do this, what happens? So now they're, they're going to try to get their other chopstick, right? Because they need two chopsticks. They're going to eat like this with their chopsticks. Or maybe they'll put them in the same hand. I don't know, whatever. But, so, so what do I have here, right? What, 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 is, what, what is this condition, right? Everyone has one chopstick, right? Can anybody make forward progress? Now, this is a deadlock, right? So I have a, I have a deadlock, and I have, this, I have a circular dependency graph that just kind of winds its way around the table, right? This guy has this resource, wants this resource. This guy has this resource. You, know, you, you can see how this goes, right? In this case, I have five different threads or philosophers that have, that have caused a deadlock, OK? Um, and so, again, we can talk about how to address this deadlock and any deadlock by relaxing one of those four requirements, right? Relaxing or eliminating one of the four conditions that are requirements for deadlock, right? So, oops, I didn't want to go back to this again. OK, so the first one is that there's protected access to shared resources that involves waiting. Okay? So for example, if I, had a, if I had a way so that if I couldn't get the second chopstick, 
I would just put down the first chopstick. I wouldn't wait for the second chopstick. I would just drop the first one, right? So if I had a way to do this, right, then this problem would solve itself, right? Because somebody would realize that they couldn't get the second chopstick, drop the first chopstick, and that would break the cycle, right? And then somebody would get two, and a couple of people would end up with two, and a couple of people would end up with one. But um, the problem is that when you look at the semantics of the locks on your system, for example, lock acquire sleeps if it can't acquire the resource. There's no option not to sleep, right? Like, you are going to be put to sleep and woken up when the resource becomes available, right? So again, this requires some change to the semantics of, of locks as they're usually implemented, right? So this might require a new primitive, right? So here, again, here's another condition that requires a new mechanism. I can request both chopsticks at once, right? I could have some, and it wouldn't necessarily mean that I would have to have a lock for each pair of chopsticks, right? It could just mean that there was some, you know, there's some lock acquire call on my system that tries to lock both locks, right? And doesn't return unless it can lock both locks, right? And that would be kind of interesting to see if you can implement something like that. But again, this is a new mechanism, right? We don't, we don't have that. Right? Our lock acquire locks one lock, OK? Um, so again, this is the most common way of getting out of deadlock, right, is to break cycles. And the normal way that we break cycles is we impose some kind of ordering on the requests. Okay, that ordering can be entirely arbitrary, but there has to be a well-defined order for a set of locks. If you have an ordering for a set of locks in which those locks are always acquired, you cannot deadlock, right? Because you cannot, you cannot have a circular graph, right? So for example, if I numbered the chopsticks 0 through 4, right? And I always grab the higher number chopstick first, then this case wouldn't deadlock. And I'll go back and show you this on the picture in a second, right? Um, and then the final way is to fi figure out a way to detect deadlock and essentially take a resource away from a threat, right? So the system had a way of identifying that there was this deadlock condition that we had just seen, and it essentially went to like uh, Isaac Newton. It was like, boom, I'm taking your chopstick. Um, that, that would also work, right? So let's, so let's look at each one of these, right? So, or at least a couple of them. Uh, where did my philosophers go? There they are. OK. So here's where we got to, right? OK, so, so again, there's a couple of options here. One option is I can take, uh, you know, I can take somebody, discard, and I can go whack, right? I could just take his chopstick away, and I could give it to, to, to Isaac Newton. And then, and then essentially, uh, some of these other things would, would, also, would also fall down, right? So that, that's one way of getting out of this cycle, right? Another way to do this would be to number the chopsticks, right? So if I numbered these chopsticks 0 through 4, and my rule was that I always grab the higher numbered chopstick first, then what's going to happen is that there, or, or somebody, I, sorry, I always grab chopsticks in the order of their numbers, right? So I always start at the higher number and then go to the lower number. What's going to happen is that one of these guys is not going to grab the same chopstick as everybody else. Four people will grab the chopstick on their left. One guy will grab the chopstick on his right. Okay, and that will break me out of the cycle. Let me see if I can describe how this would work. Right, so this is zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, so this guy has chopsticks. So this guy is the one who's going to help us, right? Because he has chopsticks zero and four. Right, everybody else is going to grab the same chopstick. This guy has one zero. This guy has two one. This guy has three two. This guy has four three. Right. So all four of these guys, I wish I knew this guy's name. He's got great hair. Um, but all these guys are going to grab the same chopstick. Okay? This guy has chopstick 0 and 4. Right? He is going to try to grab this chopstick first. Okay? And depending on who wins between him and this other guy, whose name I don't know, who has big hair, or hair so dark it blends in with the background of the painting, um, one of them will win and get this chopstick. right? And, and the other one will fail and not have a chopstick, and then, and then other, several other people will be able to acquire the chopsticks they want. Right? So this, this, is the, this is the one guy at the table right, who will no longer be grabbing the chopstick on his left. Right? So this, this, uh, this ordering has got us out of the circular dependency graph. Right? And a deadlock will not occur. There is a problem on assignment one that is suspiciously similar to this problem. It has a little bit more subtlety to it. but. Uh, but there's a, a similarly good solution in terms of establishing a consistent order and always locking in that order. Okay? Any questions about this example? All right, good. Um, so 
There's, there's another uh, problem with synchronization primitives, and this is something else that we ask you guys to address and we're going to look at for assignment one, which is called starvation. So in starvation, what happens is that there are, so deadlock is a condition where a number of threads can get to a point where nobody is able to make progress, right? Starvation is a case where some threads can be prevented from making progress for an arbitrary long period of time if certain conditions are true. Okay? So in a starvation case, some threads are making progress. Other threads are not. And when, particularly when you guys are designing your reader-writer locks, you should be careful to make sure that starvation can't happen. Because reader-writer locks are a classic case where it's very easy to starve one class of requests. Right? Normally, with reader-writer locks, if they're not implemented carefully, it's very easy to starve writers. Because writers require exclusive access to the resource. And if I have a steady stream of readers that are coming in and reading, the writer may never get access. Okay? Now, of course, by never, I just mean for an unbounded period of time. Right? But the point is, there shouldn't be a case where I can uh, create a series of requests that would cause some threads to not make progress for an unbounded, potentially unbounded period of time. Right? You know, again, at, at the limit, the system shuts off. Right? So something is going to stop happening, and that one writer who's been waiting for weeks will finally get a chance to write. Right? But that's not acceptable in, in our normal definition of what starvation is. Right? So it's not forever, but it just means for some unbounded period of time. Okay? So we talked last time a little bit about race conditions. We talked a little bit on Monday about race conditions, cases where I I'm, I'm, I'm have problems with correctness. Okay? So race conditions are on one end of my spectrum where I don't have enough synchronization to produce a correct solution. Now I have, I've come to the other limit, where potentially if I start throwing locks all over my system, right, locking everything that could potentially be a shared resource and even things that don't need to be locked, I might have these deadlock conditions that start to occur. So let me ask you as a programmer, what would you prefer? Nick, race conditions or deadlock? <coughs> Why? What's true about a deadlock compared with the race condition? I think Nick got onto it, but not strongly as I wanted. Peng. So, right, so deadlocks, and what does that mean about a deadlock? What's, so let me just give the answer away. What's easier to detect? A deadlock. Because the system stops running, right? With a race condition, you might have some weird thing that happens where some data gets corrupted, and eventually, normally, in the kernel, race conditions lead to some kind of fatal error, right? But that error might occur, like, much later. And it might take you a while so you, the, this, this will bedevil you guys for assignment two and assignment three because you'll have cases where you have not synchronized things properly and stuff will just go wrong, right? Like weird things will happen, right? You'll run a user program that's supposed to be bin CP and it'll have some pages in it from bin cat, right? And it's going to not act like CP and it's going to not act like cat either. It's going to just do something dumb, right? Um, and you'll be scratching your head like what is happening here, right? Where it was with, with a, I don't know, what do you get when you mate CP and cat? I don't know. Like CP that's, that, that spits out output as it's copying? I don't know. Whatever. Um, so, so anyway, the, the point is that what, what happens is that something wrong will happen, but then it's going to be quite difficult to trace back. Whereas as soon as you have a deadlock, right, you, you know that something bad happened, right? You can see the system isn't doing anything. Potentially, you have state about the threads that have deadlocked. You might, on modern systems with good deadlock detection, you might have know exactly what resources they were trying to acquire, right? So, you know, you don't necessarily know exactly how they got there, and it might be tricky to figure out what happened. But you, you, the system is kind of frozen in the state where the problem happened, as opposed to a race condition where something isn't, and doesn't end up calculated correctly, but the system just goes on and blunders on until something weird happens, right? So I would, I'll take the deadlock over, over the race condition, but I'll leave this up to you guys to decide. 
All right, so so far we've talked primarily about locks, OK? And locks are largely designed to protect critical sections and other pieces of shared state. Locks have, and I mentioned this a little bit on Wednesday too, I mean, locks in some ways have their own explicit, blah, blah, not explicit, implicit communication built in, right? So lock release can be thought of as a signal, to some degree, a certain kind of signal, from a thread that it's done using a resource and that resource is now available, or it exited the critical section and another thread can now enter, okay? Um, and in order to receive the signal, the thread has to be sleeping, right? So a thread has to have tried to acquire the lock, and release can be thought of as a signal from the thread that has released the resource to the ones that are waiting on it, right? Remember when we talked about synchronization primitives, we said we had two goals. One was to enable correctness, and locks are a tool for doing that, but another goal was to enable communication. And there are other types of signals that I might want to deliver between threads that are coordinating access to the same resource, right? So here are some examples. There's a buffer that has data in it now, right? Maybe that data came from a network socket or a file, but maybe there's some other threads on the system that are responsible for doing something with the data once the data is in the buffer, okay? Uh, or your child has exited, right? My parent called wait, and it blocked, and the child kept running, and then at some point later the child exits, and the kernel wants a way of telling the thread that the parent process that was waiting to receive the child's exit code, hey, your child exited, and you can continue, okay? So we refer to a certain type of, of uh, signaling mechanism within the kernel, and this is one that you guys will get to implement, as a condition variable, okay? And a condition, when I started using condition variables, I probably spent five years before I really thought about what it meant, like what, because sometimes we call them CVs, right, which is probably not a good thing to do, right, because condition variables really are what they, what they describe, right, a condition variable is a signaling message, it is not, uh, on the other hand, condition variables maybe have a confusing name, because a condition variable is not a variable, right, it is a signaling mechanism that is designed to allow threads to safely communicate when certain changes to a variable have occurred. Right? So conditions involving this variable, right? So CV weight is, so this is part of the condition variable interface. CV weight is a call that allows me to wait until a condition is true, right? And CV weight is usually used in a block of code that tests the condition to ensure it is true. And then there's usually a call called CV notify that is used to alert other threads that the condition is true, okay? And the condition, again, is usually represented as some, cha some change to shared state that's significant to certain threads, right? So the buffer has data in it, which I can measure by having a variable called buff size. And if buff size is greater than zero, then some threads that are waiting for data in the buffer are able to run, right? So when I, those threads are going to CV wait until the buff size is greater than zero, and threads that put things into the buffer are going to call CV notify to let those threads know that there is data in the buffer, right? Um, there's also a third part of the CV interface, which is called CV signal, right? Wait, sorry. Oh, well. There, so there, there, are three, there, there are three calls to the CV interface. There is wait, which waits for the condition to become true. There's a notify or broadcast mechanism that alerts every thread that's waiting. And then there's usually a way to alert only one thread, right? So the, the, when the condition changes, the thread that has changed the condition has the choice of waking up everybody who's waiting or waking up one thread, right? And this can be used in certain cases as an optimization mechanism, right? If I know, for example, that I don't need to wake up everybody because only one person's going to be able to get access to the resource, then it might be safe to only wake up one thread, right? So we'll, we'll look at an example of this, okay? So again, CB condition variables represent and are used to convey more information than locks, right? Locks are just locked, unlocked, right? They, they can't represent more complex state, right? Whereas condition variables are used to represent state that usually can be in, you know, two, three, n different states, right? And where threads want to know when certain things have changed, right? So again, a buffer can be full, it can be empty, or it can just have data in it. Right? If the buffer is full, then certain threads may want to know that because they can't do certain things. If the buffer is empty, certain threads may want to know that because they can't do certain things. And if the buffer has some data in it, then you know, maybe everybody can make progress. Right? right, exactly. So this is what I just said. Sometimes I feel like I'm reading the slides mind. Um, all right, so 
Okay, so here's here's the example we're going to work through, right? We, this is a you know, classic example using CVs. It's it's the bounded uh, buffer producer consumer <coughs> problem. I have a buffer of data that concerns a, contains a certain number of data items. It's a fixed size buffer, and I have threads that are withdrawing and inserting items into that buffer. Okay, clearly I can't withdraw an item if the buffer is empty. Clearly I can't insert an item if the buffer is full, right? Um, and I have two so I have two different types of threads, three different states, right? Um, this is again what I just said, okay. right? Um, so whenever you guys start start working on a synchronization problem like that, it's it, like this. Particularly if you're using condition variables, it's a good idea to write down what the conditions are that you're tracking, right? So in this case, um, we're tracking the state of the buffer, and we have these three states: full, empty, or in between, right? Um, and here are some invariants that we want to make sure are true, right? So if the buffer is full, the producers cannot put more items into it, right? So producers must sleep if the buffer is full. Consumers must sleep if the buffer is empty because they can't withdraw items, okay? The final two things that we also need to think about, right? This is you know, kind of like designing recursive base cases or something like that. Um, so if there is room in the buffer, producers should not be sleeping, right? And if there is data in the buffer, consumers should not be sleeping. So, so this, this, is, this is a condition that we want, OK? So here's our example. I have this produce function. I have this consume function. We assume that producer threads run produce, consume threads run consume, OK? And at some point, the producer thread is just going to put the item into the buffer, and the consume thread is going to get the item from the buffer. There's other code in here, clearly, right? But let's, let's think about how we're going to design this. So, so the, first, the first question I have to ask is, there, you know, we're going to have, you know, we look back there and there's probably what we're going to end up having, right, is some, um, maybe it comes up pretty quickly, right? A count, right? How many items are in the buffer, right? This count allows me to test what state the buffer is in. If the count is zero, the buffer is empty. If the count is equal to the buffer size, it's full. And if it's not one of those cases, then it's in between, right? What is true about this global count? What's that? It's going to be atomic. Well, is it going to be atomic yet? I mean, I like that as an aspirational goal, right? So, so why would I want this to be atomic? Bart, who is going to be modifying this variable? When does the, when does the count go up? And when does it go down? So will this variable be modified by multiple threads? Potentially at the same time. OK, and what does that mean? If I have a piece of shared state potentially modified by multiple threads, I need to make sure those modifications are safe by doing what? What other synchronization primitive do I need here? Tom. I need a lock, right? This is shared state. It's shared state that's accessed by multiple threads. So, and, and this, is, this is an important thing to note with condition variables, right? A condition variable, and in fact, on your system, a condition variable requires that you pass it a lock, right? Because a condition variable is also always associated with a condition, right, expressed by a variable, which is shared state, and that condition is always protected by a lock, OK? Yeah. Yeah, but the, the, so the, yeah, it will be. But the condition variable we're going to use the CV interface, right? So the, yeah, the condition variable is itself shared state, but but that's okay, right? This, on the other hand, is not explicitly synchronized, right? So this is just a piece. If if I had both people changing this, right? Again, you might think that a plus plus and a minus minus are atomic operations. They're not, right? They're not necessarily atomic operations. So so we have to lock this count, okay? So CVs are always associated with that condition. That condition is always shared. That condition is always protected by a lock, right? So CVs are always associated with the lock, right? You can have multiple condition variables associated with the same lock, right? So multiple condition variables indicating different things about a single condition. But there is always at least one lock associated with the condition variable, OK? 
So I don't, I don't even know if I have the lock in here. I've talked about it so much, maybe I forgot about it, right? OK, so my producer, right, essentially, again, what I said is when the, count, when the buffer is full, the producer cannot continue, right? So what is the producer going to do? Or what does the producer have to do if the count is full? Remember, what was my requirement? If the, producer, if the count is full, the producer should do what? I hear muttering, but no answers. Varun? It has to wait, OK? Now, after the producer puts an item into the buffer, it's going to bump the count, right? So this is still just kind of the control flow here, right? The consumer starts to look very similar, right? So when the con buffer is empty, the consumer is going to wait. Once the consumer is able to make through, it's going to decrement the count, right? So this is, you know, again, without any synchronization, Right? This is basically the solution to this problem. Right? Now let's look at how we protect the shared state and use condition variables to enable communication between these threads. Right? Actually, sorry, when I used these originally, I was, I was setting this up as a way to use condition variables. But clearly, we're using condition variables. That's what we've been talking about. Okay. All right. So let's, let's, let's rewrite this using condition variables. So this is the basic control flow we want. Right? But we have a couple of requirements. Right? First of all, we need to protect the count. Protect this house. Protect the, this count, right? Um, secondly, we need to enable communication between the producer and consumer. So the consumer, now see, the consumer knows when to wait. But the consumer doesn't know when to stop waiting or when to wake up, right? When the condition has changed in a way that's significant for it, right? Same thing for the producer. The producer knows when to wait, but it doesn't know when to wake up, OK? So I'm going to add my condition variable right, that's, gonna, that's associated with this, this count. And remember, for every condition variable, I have a lock. Right? This lock exists to protect the count. So if I have a lock for the count, where do I need to lock here? Where, where are places where I'm going to need to lock around the count? I have a count. Right? It's shared state. I have this lock that's associated with it. Where do I need to acquire and release the lock? Bethany. Give me one place. There's like four. Um, around the uh, the buffer that the count Yeah, so whenever I change the count, I definitely have to lock around it, right? So I have a plus plus here, okay? And I have a minus minus here. So I need to make sure that when I adjust the count, I'm holding the lock, right? So that those, those adjustments are safe. Jeremy, yeah. Yeah, and whenever I read the count, right? So, what I, so again, remember I had this requirement that said, I don't want the producer to be, sorry, I don't want the consumer to be sleeping if there are items in the buffer, right? If I didn't protect the count, here's what could happen, right? Let's say the count is zero. Consumer comes in here. It checks that the count is zero. Then it's going to sleep, right? But let's say that right after it checks that the count is zero, the producer runs and puts an item into the buffer, right? It runs all the way through, bumps the count, but I'm already going to sleep, right? Now the consumer is asleep, but there's an item in the buffer, right? So this is the type of thing that can happen if I don't lock around the count, right? I need to make sure that access to the count is atomic, OK? So I definitely need to acquire it. Oop. OK, so I definitely need to acquire it before I check, right? And here's how I use CV weight. Right? So this is the, the classic design pattern for using CV weight. Okay? What CV weight, oh, whoa, 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 come back. I didn't want to do that. I want to do this. Okay. So CV weight, and this is the semantics that are used by your system, right? takes the condition variable to wait on, and it takes a lock associated with the, the condition that I'm checking. CV weight will check that I hold the lock and blow up if I don't. So if I call CV weight and I don't hold the lock associated that I pass in, CV weight will, should, should die, right? Because this is, that's a programming error. What CV weight will do is it will sleep on the condition variable and drop the lock, right? So when I call CV weight, two things happen kind of simultaneously, right? The first one is I drop count lock. The second thing is I sleep on the condition variable, OK? When CV weight returns, I hold the lock. 
So the idea is that CV weight s drops the lock before it sleeps so other things can happen, right? But when I wake up, I grab the lock again, OK? So the idea is every time I come through this condition, I hold the lock, right? And as soon as I exit this, I still hold the lock, OK? So CV weight, you can think of as not altering the fact that you hold the lock. When CV weight returns, you still have the lock, so it's safe to check the condition, OK? And what I do here is that I just sit in this loop, right? Because it's possible in, in the scenario we're about to describe that, so, so, why do, so here's a good question. Why do I need to check the count every time? Right? Why not just have if count equals full, CV weight? And then I just keep going. Right? Why would I need to check the count every time? That's in, on, a, on, a t on a high level, that is true. Right? So there's multiple threads going on. What, but what's, what's like an example of a case where I might, be wake, I might wake up, but then I might check the count and it might still be full? Amen. Well, so we haven't, we haven't looked at where we're going to put in the calls to CV signal yet, right? But, but here's a case where this could happen, right? So let's say there's, um, the buffer is full, OK? But there's five producers that are waiting. And let's say one consumer comes through and takes one item out of the buffer. And potentially, all five consumers, sorry, all five producers now wake up. But how many of them are going to get to put an item in the buffer? One, right? And for the other four, they're going to check the count again. It's going to be full. They're going to go back to sleep, right? So almost always when you see condition variables used, they're used in a loop like this, right? That checks the condition every time I come out of the loop, right? OK. So I know I need to release the lock, so let's put in the calls to lock release, right? So, and this is, this, this is essentially almost close to correct, right? So I grab the lock, I wait till the buffer, uh, I wait while the buffer is full. Now when I exit this loop, I know that the count is not equal to full, so I can put in my item, bump the count, and release the lock, right? The consumer ends up looking very similar, right? I acquire the lock, I wait while the count is zero, and after I deck the count, I drop the lock. So this looks good. Does this work? Anyone want to venture a guess? What's, what's usually the answer when I ask that question? Dan? No. <laughs> I, I got to start messing with you guys more. No, this is perfect. This is exactly. Right, so what's missing here? Tim, I have calls to wait. Yeah, I, like wh wh who's ever going to wake this dude up, you know? Like, this guy runs through and, and, and decks the count, and the producer's still waiting, right? So I need, I need to put in calls to CV signal or CV broadcast in here somewhere, right? Um, but where am I going to do that? Where is the right place to, to call CV signal or CV broadcast here? Yeah, Brian. Uh, in the other thread, like, for the producers, you would notify them from the well, well, okay. So, so actually, that's that's a that, so. Uh, I don't want to go down that path. Um, I have one CV here, right? I could have two CVs. I could have one producer one for producers and one for consumers, right? But I don't. I only have one condition variable, right? So you're right that the producers need to notify consumers, or consumers need to notify producers. But it turns out that that ends up looking very similar in this particular example, right? So essentially, both threads need to have some call to CV broadcast here, right? So now, the, so again, the calls to broadcast are supposed to be where the condition changes, right? And so I change the condition here, and I change the condition here, right? Or I change the count. See, this is interesting, right? And then I call CV broadcast, right? So this example works. I'm not lying, right? Um, but does it work well? Masakazu. What do you think? So this example will run, and it is safe, right? This, this example will, will work properly. But what's a, what's a problem with it? This is where we'll end today. Yeah? So what happens? OK, so that's a good question. What happens if there's a context switch between my put and, and changing the count? Is, that, is this safe in this particular example? Still has the lock acquired. Yeah, so 
whatever thread is doing the put or get still has the lock, right? So it turns out in this particular example that the lock that I'm acquiring is not just protecting the count. It's also protecting the buffer, right? So once I grab the lock, nobody else can make a change to the buffer, right? So the idea is that these two lines of code, this whole thing is now a critical section, right? Both of them are, right? So these two lines of code and these two lines of code cannot be executed, uh, cannot be interleaved, right? That's a good question, right? But what's, what's another problem with this, Varun? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, so CV weight will not return until it can get the lock, right? So CV weight will grab the lock, and if it has to wait for the lock, it waits for the lock, right? It's a good question, okay? So remember we talked about the count is representing a condition, right? But that condition had three states, right? The states were full, empty, and in between. So if I increment or decrement the count, am I necessarily changing the state of the buffer? Yes or no? No, because if I'm in between, let's say the buffer has four items in it, and the buffer has a size of eight, and I bump the count. I haven't changed the buffer from full to empty or from full to neither, from neither to empty, right? I haven't made a change in the state, right? So what's going to happen here is that if I broadcast every time I change the count, right? So let's say that the... Um, Let's say that the buffer is, is, is in this in-between state. I'm calling broadcast every time, right? That's not necessarily a potential problem, because again, I will call broadcast when I need to, right? But what are the cases when I need to call broadcast? There are two cases where I need to call broadcast. Look down. What's one of them? Well, when it goes from neither to full, sorry, when it goes from full to other and from empty to other, right? So a better way to do this is the following, right? So, when I'm the producer, the only time I call broadcast is if I just put the first item into the buffer, right? Because in this case, the consumer should wake up, right? If I'm the consumer, the only time I call broadcast is if I've just consumed the, the, the you know, I've just created the first empty space in the buffer, right? Because that's when the producer should wake up, right? So this is, this is a better way of writing this example. Yeah, Dan. You have to hold it. It's just it's CV broadcast and, and CV signal will just check to make sure you hold the lock, right? But you're right. They don't they don't manipulate the lock at all, right? So they don't necessarily have to hold. No. So the idea with this is a good question, right? So the the idea with CV broadcast is that it's a programming error to call it if you don't hold the lock, right? Remember, both threads that call CV broadcast here hold the lock. Because when CV wait returned, they had the lock, right? And they haven't released it yet. So if I put the release up here, and the reason for this, right? Why? So this is a good question, right? And Dan's raised a good point. Why would CV broadcast and CV signal check to make sure I hold the lock? Let's say I didn't hold the lock and I called CV broadcast or CV signal, right? This CV broadcast and CV signal are supposed to express the fact that I know something about the condition of the variable, right? I know that it's in a certain state and I want to tell people about it. But if I don't hold the lock, what's wrong with that, what's wrong with that claim? Yeah, I'm a, Yeah, the condition might have changed, right? The thing that's preventing the condition changing when I call CV broadcast is I hold the lock, right? If I drop the lock, let's say I put the lock release up here, right? Okay? And then I called CV broadcast. The problem is that other threads could have run in there, and so you know, the, my version of the count may not be ready. Right? So the idea with CV broadcast is that I have to hold the lock because the, holding the lock is what's supposed to be preventing that condition from changing. Right? And if I don't hold the lock, then I really don't know anything about the condition. Right? As soon as I drop the lock here, I don't know necessarily what count is. Right? OK, good. So we will, I will see you back on Monday, and we'll talk a little bit about semaphores.